All right, welcome back to Search for Truth Reality. Uh, we've had a nice lunch together. Thank you, Bob. It's great. Um, we're going to continue our conversation. And I know that both of you would like to cover, cover a couple of things. I want to start with Bill, because there's some things that you definitely want to want to talk about, uh, life with uh, the Admiral during the war. Well, what I was alluding to is uh, it, it was important to understand that uh, the subject that's coming back from Germany by the operatives. They're bringing information back that is totally, almost unbelievable. Uh, Admiral Riccobata many times shook his head as the operative is trying to describe that particular portion of some of these programs. Uh, it was difficult to realize that there were thousands of situations that had been implemented into Germany by the extraterrestrials uh, totally changing their way of life, including extending some of the Germans' life because the extended life program was already in operation in Germany way before it got started at TRW later on in many years. Did it actually get started at TRW or, that, or was that just a study? It was a study that went into a program. The program involved uh, the four largest uh, advanced uh, medical companies in the country. Uh, it has been a classified program. Uh, Scripps in La Jolla, California is heavily involved in this program. And uh, I've talked to a number of people there at Scripps uh, who are currently still working on this program. And I think that it's nice if you sort of uh, let me describe what happens uh, to people that get on the program. And there's been over, uh, I'd say at least 50 or 60 men in the past uh, 20 years and probably over 40 of women that have been in, involved in this extended life program. And it's all the way from a few weeks of extended life out to the highest is 43 years. And so uh, the TRW initiated program, of course, when Northrop Grumman bought TRW, they got the extended life program too. So Northrop Grumman then got more involved themselves, even with considering that they now had an, an enormous laboratory, one space park, Redondo Beach, with the thrust to extend our life here. And uh, so repeating a little bit, it takes a two sh or four shots or four essentially ice aspirins over a four month period, one, at a one month at a time. And you immediately start to feel better. Uh, different people were able to, their systems were able to accept the program faster than others. Many of the fellows were really slow in getting through it and it took them a good four months to make the translation. Uh, but what happens is the men return back to 29, there's different, different years, some of them been 32, some of them were even 26, but 29 was the number that they finally ended up with. You go back to 29. The young ladies have always gone back to 21. Um, the big advantage here is that you have a minimum of 400% greater capability use of your brain. And of course, if we there going back, go back to uh, the present time where we are still only using 2.3% of our brain, not because that's what we have chosen, but it's because the reptilians have been controlling our minds on this planet for thousands of years. Uh, 
everybody asks the question, well, why is that? What does that have to do with extended life? What does that have to do with everything? Uh, turns out that uh, extended life allows you to physically be in the same capability that you were at that younger age. Not just live longer, but be able to have uh, all of the muscles, all of your systems, all of your organs, young. Uh, everything about you then is only 29 years old. Uh, this then is, if you want to use a comparison, sort of an opposite direction of what some of the Solar Warden naval officers who have recently spoken publicly about returning from previous lives aboard Navy spacecraft carriers. Uh, they essentially reverse that operation and their mind is then blocked to where they have no memory of the 20 years they spent in the Navy. Now, if they have gone ahead and uh, developed, developed a second phase of another 20 years in the Navy, they also had an option, I understand, to where they could start over or continue at the same age of the first 20 years. So this system has many different aspects to it. Its relationship to us in reversing our capability uh, and increasing our technical capability is extremely important because frankly, we don't have time in 75 years to even find out what's going on. Which is your average lifespan of a human. So with so what you're saying is with the uh, uh, with the age regression, life extension, uh, you become more uh, capable, useful, uh, able to contribute more because you, you grow up to a certain point, you become intelligent, you can increase that in challenges. This is one other uh, effect of the uh, life preservation that uh, you've mentioned to me before that involves the capacity, uh, the mental capacity. What is that? Yeah, your mental capacity goes up 400%, minimum. Some of it even to seven and eight hundred percent okay this is staggering because it was already in your brain but you haven't been using that like nordic people that live 2400 years or whatever and the blue people too uh, but uh, not being able to live that long restricts the use of the brain that you do have, and uh, for the reptilians to be controlling our brain uh, capability, uh, that's one thing. But to prevent us from living longer, uh, I guess you have to ask the question, well, why would they do that? If they kept us running for a longer period of time, they could use us more. But there's kind of a side effect that's in this. And uh, it gets into an area that uh, uh, Bob and I have discussed, and I guess you and I have discussed too, and uh, probably be better not to get in that part. Okay, very well. Fair enough. You've, uh, uh, I just want to make it clear for uh, our audience that uh, aspirin is a billism for any pill or drug. Right. It's not. It's not you're taking four aspirin. So don't go run out there taking your aspirin yeah. one a month because it's, right. it's nothing's going to happen. The blue people. You've mentioned them just a moment ago. Now, is this something from your own experience or something that you've heard from from others? Uh, I have to discuss discuss my part because yes, there's a great deal of data about them helping us now, but uh, essentially, one of the groups of people that were assisting TRW, Nordic people, were the blue type. The, the level of assistance was primarily uh, advi advisory, not by a person, but by the thoughts. So the information was coming to them, similar to we get or that's similar to the way that I got information from my Nordic secretary at Douglas, 
okay, on the Apollo program. Uh, except she was there, but she could telepathically give me the information. I could be in Huntsville, Alabama, and she's in Santa Monica, and she could tell me what to do. She's physically present. I mean, she's in this realm. She's in this 3D world. If I'm hearing you right, the blue... Bees. The blue people were not physically here. They were here. Their minds were here, but they weren't here in their bodies. Were you the only one experiencing the interface with the blue people? Did, did I what? Are you the only one that's interfacing or communicating? No, no there's, there's thousands of people that have uh, been interviewing, uh, interfacing with them. Mm -hmm. But in the context of TRW and the research that's being done there, was there anybody else there at TRW who? Uh, yes, there was different programs that they were involved in. And uh, they were then uh, shown in a way that uh, their thought force Part levels were in the conference rooms at uh, in technical meetings, and they would make their suggestions uh, telepathically, and uh, say one of the people that wasn't that was in the meeting that was not familiar with that correspondence or those people would end up saying, uh, uh, "Those are the blues that are talking over there. That's their recommendation." and Yes, they fully understand our problems in the program. So essentially what you have is telepathic information being suggested not to three or five people in the meeting, but to all of the people in the meeting. So everybody hears the, the suggestion. Well, as, where as did that come from? Well, as though they're there. So what yeah. you're telling me is everybody in that room, um, for whatever the purpose is and whatever the project is, everyone is privy to the blue people communication through telepathic thought. Uh, in that level of uh, TRW, yes, and, those, and on those programs of TRW, totally unaware in most of engineering, okay? Separate, a separate, separate program, communication, uh, advisory. How long ago did they start their communications with TRW? Do you have any idea? Uh, well, this was shortly after TRW formed, okay, which was uh, 58, 59 time period. And uh, uh, they, uh, most of the people in TRW were actually technical consultants to the think tank at Douglas before they got involved with TRW Space Systems. And Thompson, Ramo, and Wilderich were the three people that were working for Douglas on these programs. So they separated and formed their own company. But uh, the company, unlike most uh, think tank, think tank organizations uh, was able to essentially come up with a requirement uh, the monies would be unlimited to study that program so they do a brief program study on it and then if it appeared to be something that was uh, uh, plausible uh, funds would just be flowing out we, we have never had a problem getting money to implement different programs or different uh, uh, systems. Uh, medical systems, uh, space systems, uh, commercial systems, because we even had, like at Douglas, we had commercial space systems uh, in design and development at TRW2. So uh, it was easy for us to get together, have different people come in, make the recommendations on the program, and then uh, be part of a reviewing team to establish whether we're going to go full bore on that program, and then come up with an unsolicited bid back to whatever organization this would be orientated to. If it was an Air Force missile program, uh, we, we'd go for that program. If it was a Navy space communication satellite program, we would develop an unsolicited bid for that. And I think that doing that and having advise, advisors, such as the blue people, uh, uh, addressing uh, 
what they were most interested in was the commercial uh, involvements, but they also assisted in the military. And so this, this was a major thrust inside of hundreds of different laboratories and subsystem labs who are boxed into different areas. So it's a, it's a program that the other laboratories are totally unaware of. And the top, of course, corporate, uh, are aware of all of the programs. But uh, different labs are totally, in fact, in some cases, there would be as many as three separate laboratories studying the same subject and addressing it in a different manner to find out uh, previous to the trade-off studies. And I didn't get into trade-off studies before mm -hmm. because they weren't done uh, in engineering in most companies. Uh, uh, most companies would develop a new system uh, and agree that that's the way it should be done. They freeze the design and they run with that uh, development of that design. Uh, at TRW it was always different. You went through that first phase, you came up with all of the, all of the background information and you're convinced that's the best way to approach that program. Then you drop it. You come up with two different ways to initiate and discuss that program. They're called trade-off studies. Long before you ever got to an unsolicited bid back to any of your potential contractors or companies, you did the two studies. Uh, I don't want to change the subject, but uh, sometimes uh, in conversations between different people from different labs, maybe just at lunch, uh, somebody would uh, mention the blues. And uh, maybe the rest of the people at that table uh, had no idea what you were referring to. And because one fellow is referring it to his friend over here, mm -hmm. it was the blues that did so and so, or they said so and so, like this. So you'd hear this in casual conversation. It's code speak, but you know only those on the inside are. Yeah, because you, you normally don't talk about that, okay? Yeah, yeah. And but uh, that continually did come out, and uh, most people never put the two things together to what this really was, because essentially you're being advised by extraterrestrials on a standard basis. And really, it's, it's relatively safe anyway, because the blues could refer to anything, really, a bundle of wires, an assembly, you know, a screwdriver, who knows, you know. It could be anything, a craftsman. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah. But uh, blues came along later, and that was something on a continuous base, okay, of, uh, you got to say, open, extraterrestrial assistance. Yeah. Did you, know, did you know about the blues before Bill just now mentioned it? Never heard of the blues. We just all kinds of revelations yeah. today here. Thank you for all these gifts, Bill. It's really Well, it's, it's, it's part of what we're doing, okay? And it's part of what we've been doing. Uh, uh, there was, uh, I'd like to go back, if we could, for a few minutes uh, to uh, Admiral Rickabata's efforts with uh, his operatives in Germany. Um, do you want to talk about your experience and then get into that in so far as what it's like living as a young sailor working for Admiral Rickabata? Yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I won't get into it, but if, if any of you folks out there are interested at all in what Bob and I are saying, uh, Please uh, pick up that book that we've got, which is uh, selected by extraterrestrial, okay? Uh, uh, and wait a minute, if you don't even buy it, just get on your computer and type in William Tompkins. You don't even have to say Tompkins, the aerospace engineer. All you have to do is just type in William Tompkins. You're going to get pages and pages and pages about this subject. Okay, on the internet. Uh, okay, but 
what was happening was that uh, when I was uh, eight or nine years old, I built a seven, six different types of what I would assume a space rocket would be. I built the models, great big models. And uh, uh, one of the Navy commanders saw the models. Uh, he was a friend of my dad. And uh, so he said, you ought to build uh, ship models. Yeah, that, that's a good model. You ought to build ship models. So anyway, I built some 45 Navy ship models, where an aircraft carrier is about this big, a destroyer is about this big. All the same scale. These are all on display in Congress yeah. now. Right? And I'm, I'm just a kid, mm -hmm. and so I look up stuff in the newspapers. I look and start collecting different types of uh, magazine articles uh, where they've got photographs of different ships. And then my dad takes us down, we were living in Hollywood, my dad takes us down to Long Beach and the Navy has these enormous big powered uh, open boats, powered boats that they use to transport personnel to and from the ships uh, to the base, uh, to the harbor. So we rode those out like on a Sunday afternoon. So we get to walk on the ships quite a bit. They, they hardly covered up too much, but you couldn't take a camera. So. Uh, I'm interested in the latest version of, say, an aircraft carrier's secret equipment, where the uh, the three-inch anti-aircraft guns are, uh, where the big five-inch automatic uh, uh, anti-aircraft guns are located on the ship. And I have to have my models just as most up-to-date as I can get them. And, uh, so then I need radar, and uh, I need uh, where, I didn't know it at the time, but I walked the flight deck of one of the carriers, I think it was uh, the Lexington, and a very large ship. And uh, they had steam catapults up on the bow where they used to catapult the aircraft off so they'd get a lot of them off real fast, a whole squadron of them. And uh, then they had arresting gears where you had a hook on the back of the airplane you drop down on the final approach to the flight deck and your, your hook that's dropped down catches on a cable and that stops you. So you don't have to take a lot of the runway space. So of course those were all secret things. So uh, I walk the deck and I have a little pad and I make a sketch of that, how big it is, where it's located, and this sort of thing. And then uh, radar was a problem. But at that time, they had rectangular radars with some types of uh, structure in, in between the big main support. So I walked the deck to where I can find the sun, uh, throwing a shadow onto the flight deck. So I walked that, that size of the shadow, and uh, I marked that down. Uh, then I go up to the bow, and I walk the length of the seam catapult. And when I get home, I make perspe perspective drawings of this and then three view drawings of these so that I can add these onto the ship. This is, uh, this is all from, a lot of stuff's from memory as well. So it's from your memory and, as I understand it, and your drawings. Yeah. And so then I make the drawings. Uh, and so, uh, uh, Publicity sort of got out on the ship models, and there was a couple of articles in the newspaper. But what was more important, they had the models uh, located in the window of the Broadway department store on Hollywood Boulevard. And two naval officers uh, uh, saw that, and they went in and asked uh, the people in the store who the fellow was and could you get a hold of him and this sort of thing. And uh, there wasn't anything wrong with that. Uh, and then, uh, the next week, uh, after they had been there, my dad is in his office over on Wilshire Boulevard, and two of these fellows come in, and they don't arrest him, they detain him. 
okay? But they detained him for two days and two nights. This is your father. My dad. And they want to know where he got that information, particularly with uh, all of this secret stuff. And the fact that they had, as recently as five months before, relocated every anti-aircraft gun on the ship, okay? And before that, some of them didn't even have those guns on board, okay? This is before the war. <clears throat> So the next day, they let my dad out, and uh, he took them over to our little two-bedroom apartment house in Hollywood, and I shared a bedroom with my brother. And so they come in there to the bedroom, and I've got all these drawings and sketches and everything, and I've got all these newspaper articles and magazine articles and all this stuff. Uh, and it's piled halfway up to the windows on the side, uh, all around the room. And they finally figure out this kid knows what he's doing, and he's uh, doing something that's pretty accurate. Anyway, from that, uh, I was called into, uh, several months later, I was called into uh, what, what would be a naval intelligence office in San Diego, in uh, San Pedro, California. And they talked to me a lot. And uh, so what I'm trying to get to here is how did you get into the Navy and how did you get to this position working for Admiral Riccobata? So my dad gets contacted again. Uh, he takes off work, drives me back down to that same base, and uh, the same, same Navy commander was there that we talked to. And he inducts me into the Navy. And uh, I'm in my first year of high school, about halfway through it. So uh, because there was a real security problem about uh, my family moving so many times. Actually, my dad didn't have money to pay the rent, so we'd move into a place for two months. He didn't pay the rent, and we'd get thrown out and go someplace else. So this makes getting your security clearance a little problematic, trying to track all those places. Yeah. So uh, when they found this out, uh, to alleviate that, uh, the time it was going to take it, uh, uh, they inducted me into the Navy, okay? Uh, and they put me to work at the Volte Aircraft Company over in Downey, California. And they were developing a new Navy Gull Wing large Navy attack aircraft in a secret area uh, in their facility. Excuse me, do you went to basic training before this or after? Uh, after. After. So, so, so the other thing I want to kind of clarify is because I'm trying to think, how old was I when I was a sophomore in high school? You know, 14, you know, 15? I mean, you had to have been incredibly young. I mean, to be inducted in the Navy, be pulled out. They had to be breaking rules left and right to put you in. Uh, whatever it was, they did what they did. So they, uh, they put me to work at this Velti company, and, I, and supposedly it was just be for a couple of three weeks. Well, they did this. And so it turned out to be quite a bit longer because there were there other problems with my dad. And I guess I never found out what that was till later. And that was uh, his involvement with uh, Freemasons. Anyway, uh, I didn't know anything about dad being a Freemason. Uh, so uh, I got notification that I was to report back to uh, uh, Naval Intelligence in San Pedro, and uh, they flew me down to San Diego. And uh, instead of going in uh, like normal recruits, uh, uh, I was driven right over to the facility for the Naval Training Station in San Diego, and I went in. And so I finished half of the normal training, and I got call for another order to uh, 
skip that day. And uh, they took me in a Navy boat across the bay from the Naval Training Station to North Island. And I'm in North Island now. And uh, I end up uh, in an office building in an engineering department where they convert aircraft to, from the old versions to new versions of the airplanes. Big engineering department. And uh, I'm introduced to, well, for two days, I just sat in this office. And then I'm introduced to a Navy commander. He gave me some papers to study. And for another couple of weeks, I don't know anything else either. I don't see anybody. I talk to, oh, uh, oh, when I first met him, he said, uh, don't come in here without shining your shoes. And uh, uh, I had a dress uniform, but I, I just used sort of a sloppy uh, uh, seaman's work uniform in an office, okay? And I guess I didn't shine my shoes. Uh, so the third week, uh, he calls me over and he's got a lot of stuff for me to do. And he said, uh, I'm out of here. It's yours. That's the only instruction I got from this commander. I'm out of here. It's yours. It's yours. L allow me to summarize. 14, 15 years old. Go in the Navy. You don't finish your no, training. 17. 17. 17. Come on. Okay, I don't know. What to, how old are you in the Ninth grade, tenth grade, seventeen. You know, I mean, you're not even eighteen in the Navy. You, you, they pull, they put you in training. They pull you out of training. They stick you in a building over here for read this, shine your shoes. I'm out of here. It's yours. Yeah. Okay. Okay. For the, okay no, no, wait a minute. I'm a seventeen third, years old. Okay. Wait a minute. I'm a third class seaman. Okay. Uh, even better. Uh, with all these officers, all these officers are on. Okay. And, uh, Do you see how this doesn't make any sense? Yeah. No, it doesn't make sense, OK? Uh, so uh, this nice young lady comes over to me. And it turns out that she's the uh, uh, engineering uh, president. Uh, they, they, this is very strange. It's a Navy facility. Really? Uh, North Island Naval Air Station is strange. But uh, it's structured exactly like an aircraft company. So the title of the president of the company, or the engineers, or the engineer managers, or the draft, uh, drafting staff, or whatever, they all got commercial names, but they're all Navy officers, OK? And uh, hang on, hang on a second. So, uh, the, hang, hang on a second. so Bob. I, I have a picture in the other room of him with the women that he was working with at that time. OK. Uh, oh, you have the picture? I have the picture. Oh, is this one we were talking about over lunch? Yeah, that was one I was going to show you. Can you get that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take a break here. Just say, keep rolling. We're, we're good. We'll just keep rolling. Uh, actually, this one is worth this or, is, this, this, No, this one is worth seeing. So, all right, while he's off doing that, um, basically, you know, I was, I was ribbing Bill. It's like everywhere he goes, it's like it's, it's all about the skirts. You know, he's always working with the ladies. You know, everywhere there's a, there's a foxy secretary or yeah. two or three, yeah. and every job you've had, it seems there are all these beautiful women. And, and, and actually, they all were. Okay, beautiful. They all were top level. They all were graduates, and they all were tremendously capable. So you got all these all these people running around. I, I, every place I went, I had those. Yeah. Okay. Don't ask me why. Well, I, I can't answer that. Either. I, I, I want. I just find it just odd that you know here you are a third class seaman, an officer's going. It's all yours. That doesn't make any sense. These guys are running around in Navy playing Navy, but really they're corporate yeah. on a Navy base. Yeah. Uh, we, we have to get this in your, uh, when we're talking, but, yeah, we are uh, talking but, but I'm just saying, uh, uh, I got flight skins, okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, which means I fly every month, okay? And uh, this means that I am going to be trained not just as some guy to help out on an airplane, uh, I'm going to end up being a pilot. And lo and behold, the Admiral has a high wing, seven passenger, big single engine airplane that he flies all over. And I end up on board that airplane flying 
all over Western United States. As a pilot? Uh, with his pilot training me to be a pilot. Okay. And that, I got navigation, I got everything, and I never went to school one day, okay? And uh, when I came out to get a regular pilot's license, I went through that because I didn't have, any, have to take all the tests I could automatically right. take, right. okay? But the point is that I was getting flight scans, so now, I'm flying co-pilot on a Navy PB4Y2 float airplane. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh my God. Now, with is this that, you? Is this really you? That is little Billy Tompkins. Come now, on. Billy Tompkins is attractive. Now the gentleman. girl, in, the girl in the middle above my head, that's yeah. the one that I went with. Okay. She was my girlfriend. All right. And actually, she was one of the gals that uh, helped me out. This is actually a really cool picture. I, I like this. This is like something you might. It's, it's got badges on. It says North Island, I think, then. Yeah. A and R N A S S D. Yeah. North Island. What's the SSD stand for? Yeah. What is what is S S D? Now this is a photograph of me working. Oh, it says N A S S D. What's the S S D? Yes, I was, you know, my father and grandfather and uncles are all Navy. I don't know this. Pathetic. Just pathetic. All right. So you want to get, you want to go, can you go tight on that? We'll set it aside. All right, we'll do it aside later. All right, that's really, that's an awesome picture. That is really, really cool. Um, that is awesome. Okay. It really that. is. That's very nice. But anyway, so uh, I, I didn't get the skins till later, but, uh, uh, the, uh, the commander that left had another fellow and his secretary came over and said, we got to talk. And so I went into his office and he sort of explained to me what I was going to be doing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the length of time was that the commander had been doing this job before I got there, but I know it must have been at least one year. So this is 1942, so that meant that Rick Abata was doing his thing in 41, okay? Which meant that Admiral Rick Abata had gone to four aircraft companies before he even got assigned to Commander Naval Air Station San Diego and discussed this subject, okay? So. The third week that I was there, the first operative come in. I have to say that's not correct. Two operatives had come in and I didn't meet. I was not in the meeting. The third week that I was there, I was invited into one of these meetings in that conference room up on top of the, the commander's tower. You mentioned tower. That. Yeah. So the way it's set up is Admiral Rick, the big big table, Admiral Rickabot is here, I'm sitting next to him here, one of the Navy captains of which I had three captain bosses and four all together because I, Admiral Rickabot was the fourth boss. Uh, so one of them would be there. The secretary would be on the end of the table to type and the operative would be on the opposite side of the table. So this is all new to me. I get a little bit of information. We're supposed to uh, try to listen to what's going on and make comments as required. So I never had any, any training for this, okay? And uh, it took a little while to find out, figure out what was going on. So the first guy that came in was one of the older Navy lieutenants in this uh, spy group, uh, which they never call them spies, but they're naval operatives. And they are uh, like investigators uh, in Germany and the occupied countries attempting to find out what the SS is doing and what the situation is with extraterrestrials are doing things with the SS. Uh, none of this made any sense. 
Uh, so that was one of the few fellows that was there for a full week. Almost every one of the rest of them for uh, three and a half years, uh, they were only there for the period of the one day, max two days, and they're back on the flight back. Yeah, these are the operatives you're talking about. Still operatives there. are gone. In and out. So we don't even have time to work with these operatives. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just what he can give us now. Mm -hmm. uh, and it had already been decided, I didn't do it, that they were going to put together packages and descend them, uh, actually distribute them out to different technical organizations in the country on a classified basis. No document that I saw had secret stamped on it, not even confidential. We learned it later on, I learned it later on. That's the way they handled it. So after the opera operator had finished presenting his information and after one or two of the captains finished all the questions to try to get better answers to what he's presenting, uh, and the Admiral does too, uh, it was my job to stay with him for the rest of the day, the night, and the next day before he gets on another plane and goes back, okay? So I'm to be his buddy to help him whatever it is that he needs if he needs whatever needs, I got to see that he gets this, okay? And by that same time, I'm to get as much additional information as I can from him of what he had presented. So I'm handed a document from the captain that's there and another note from the admirals over here, questions. Okay, I get that the next morning. In fact, it's, uh, when I go in the next morning, that's the first thing I get. Uh, but going back to how this starts by day is that always after midnight, the admirals, I'm in my barracks asleep. The admiral, admiral's aide comes in the barracks taps me on the shoulder and says one thing, he's here, nothing else. Uh, I get dressed as fast as I can get dressed and I still just look like your, your, your photograph of me. Okay. That's the way I look, okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's it. And I got my little badge. Uh, so I grab coffee on the way over we get in there, the operative sitting there already and he's got stuff on the floor next to him. He's got stuff on the table. Uh, and then he's got his own notes, pretty well outlined. Uh, some of these guys were real sharp. And uh, he presents this information, if it's communications, something about communications. He has a box full of stuff. Uh, whereas if it's about uh, some sort of propulsion systems, uh, very little. I mean, sketches, notes, this sort of thing, uh, a couple of drawings. Uh, occasional photos? Uh, occasional photos, and, and, and also, uh, uh, there, there were the hieroglyphics, okay? And he made his notes on the hieroglyphics from talking to the other German guys as to what that, what, do you guys understand what that was? What did this one mean? Okay. And he'd have, he would have a photograph of that particular bar or that uh, 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 structure, piece of, uh, uh, of metal. So these operatives would get in a position where they can see the technology that's been worked on. It's got certain things uh, glyphs inscribed upon them, whether they're Egyptian hieroglyphs or not, there's some kind of a glyph. It's something that we don't recognize. Yeah. And they've got some notes in there about, I assume, uh, what this thing is. And yeah. 
But as far as decoding what these glyphs are, do yeah. the operatives have any clue? Do they even yeah. know? So this, uh, what I'm trying to say is, uh, I even, I would ask. I had one buddy that was a, a commander and he was really friendly with me and he knew what I was doing. And so I kept asking him, you know, what in the hell, why do they do this? And I'm trying to get a better feel. We need a whole lot more information than that. How are we gonna, uh, and I always said me, because I never thought I was gonna be the one that had to deliver it, okay? I said, how are you guys gonna get this over to, to Lockheed? Or, or gosh, you, you said you're working with uh, JPL and, and Caltech. Uh, you're working with them? How are you gonna explain this? Uh, and, and I'm trying to, I'm looking for a, a manual. Okay, give me a manual. Yeah. Uh, and we don't even have a German manual on this. And, uh, but this, this, this first one was really hard for me. Yeah, so what you've described so far is really your first yeah. foray into this world. And you're expressing, it sounds like a little bit of frustration. This is my new job. I, I, there's pieces missing here. What am I supposed to do? Yeah. But surprisingly enough, uh, I seem to come on board faster than I was thought than I thought I would. Okay, and I did get help from the uh, captains. There was two of the captains that really helped me a lot. The other guy was around once in a while, never did help me. Uh, but uh, it was it was that uh, this is your job. You're not doing anything else except putting these packages together, and and. Uh, Nothing was said about mailing the packages to the contractors. It's all very unusual. I mean, that, that they would pick you, that you're so young, that you didn't finish training, that, that et, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You and fall into this position. Yeah. And now all this responsibility is kind of heaped onto your shoulders. Well, wait a minute. I, I missed the most important thing. And, and um, Dr. Black, Blacks, uh, English lesson class at Hollywood High School. I can't spell and, and I can't talk. So he takes me, puts me up in the front and makes me do a dissertation, a presentation and spell everything right. And I'm still spelling it wrong. Yeah, this is before the Navy got a hold of you? Yeah, I'm back in Hollywood High School before they took me. Okay, anyway, so I can't spell. Now this guy knows I can't spell. Yeah, also, I've seen your writing, Bill. I know you can't okay, spell. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so this goes on, and uh, we then take this rough information. I get two of the girls that my girlfriend manages, and we start to put together a breakdown. We already had a, a breakdown that they had been using for these uh, uh, organization and we were able to put this together and get pretty good packages together and then uh, run copies of this so we've got it and uh, at least one of the three Navy captains has filed every single one of these besides our regular files okay and nothing is classified but we've all got it documented and so then I have this photo lab. The, the Navy had a big photo lab there. And, and the old commander that left, he had this small personal used uh, Photoshop. And you've seen the pictures of it. And you've seen the gals that run it. Okay. That one right over there. Right over there. So when, 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 when Bill says Photoshop, it's not a, the Adobe program. It's a place that processes pictures, photographs. Yeah, so, but we, but we know not only photographs, yeah. but we run copies of all kinds of stuff yeah. that are, are possible related to this that is part of the package, okay, that we then can say, uh, I don't know whether this is that or not, but that's what he indicated. Right, I think Bill, or Bob, you wanted to make a point? Yeah, I think, Bill, you've described in great clarity the process that you went through for these 29 people for those two or three years. And clearly their focus had been told to be the technology of the UFOs, yeah. largely, right? And my question is, did they ever talk about Antarctica? 
going to Antarctica, submarines, big submarines taking people to Antarctica, relationship to the uh, any reptilians in Antarctica, or was that kind of out of scope? Uh, the operatives knew about Antarctica. They oh. knew about it. They did, okay. So, yes, that information went to Riccobata. Okay. And that was part of some of the things that were being programmed because uh, uh, one of the operatives, Bob, uh, he was into a, a, a specific facility and the facility was being packed up and being shipped to a different location. Okay. And one of the other operatives at a different point, because we, we uh, whenever we're, we're discussing with the new operator, or one of the operators just came in, we always ask of, they do, do they know what Jim is doing? Or uh, have you seen Howard lately? Do you know what, okay. what he's involved in? But none in? of the operatives came from Antarctica, as far as you know. No, but okay. they said stuff is being shipped to the submarine base. Okay. And then another thing from a total different area, uh, 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 they, they have built massive uh, truck submarines. The Germans had. 400 people sort of thing? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it's not just people, they would haul equipment too. Did they ever Trucks. talk about high energy weapons like lasers? Yes. During, during the war? Yes. During your debriefs, during your, excuse me, the, when the operatives are coming through, they were talking about the, the high energy laser weapons? Yeah. See, that's consistent with a report that's in one of the recent books I've read of, of a 400 foot submarine apparently head to surface and they were sighted by a British destroyer cruiser and they, sh they killed the destroyer with laser weapons. Uh, and this was like, like in the late four, in the, you know, 44 or so. Uh, and I, I just read that like two weeks ago as a report. <clears throat> and it's not that just they were researching them. The SS was given brand shiny new ones. Okay. So you didn't have to start from scratch from a bunch of pieces of paper like what I'm giving to these companies to go try to make something like that. And they weren't the Nordics providing this either. It was another group of extraterrestrials yeah. that had given the SS um, complete, what, a multiple multitude, just diff different, what, 14 different types, did you say? There was a number that you'd written, I, I don't yeah, recall, I, I but more than one. 13. Yeah, yeah so, thir so 13 different types of hardware flying, operable yeah. craft. Um, meanwhile, so we're here. But I got the impression that on some of these, the Nazis mounted ordinary uh, machine, gun. machine guns yeah. and weapons. Mm -hmm. But on others of them, apparently they may have considered using laser weapons. They did use the laser weapons on them, the bigger ones. Okay. Were the laser weapons invented by the Germans or by the, the reptilians? Reptilians. Okay. See, that would be new information. Yeah. Uh, the Germans, wait a minute, the Germans got real smart, okay? Uh, they were smart before this happened. Germans were very brilliant people, okay? Uh, why they had to pick the SS to go do the thing that they were going to do, uh, maybe they figured that the, that what, they, what their missions are uh, is not really very legal. Okay, and it may be that uh, that's the reason. But uh, but but back to this 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 information that comes in. Uh, you had other pieces of paper with different types of uh, numering, numerous uh, numbering systems okay, on it, that weren't German, they weren't anything that we knew about. And so they would be identified by this numbering system. And of course, this was an extraterrestrial piece of paper, okay? And 
here it is. We're not going to tell you how it works. That's what we're asking you, Lockheed, to do. We're giving you a contract. Mm -hmm. uh, you you got to figure this out. So I'm getting this stuff from every place that I go with these documents. Um, you know, you dumb a-hole or something, uh, don't give us something like this. How, how do we do, well, how, what do we do with this? Right, so they're calling you out because you've got really what amounts I to, what I mentioned earlier, it's like, like a post-it note with a stick figure. Here, go make yeah, a flying saucer. Right. It's not a request for a proposal. It's, and so, so don't blame them for having a hard time trying to figure out what the hell does the Navy want us to do. Right. I remember asking about the Germans because they were provided the, the technology, but um, in, in the form of the hardware. But there also some documentation, teaching, and, and even they had some challenges interpreting the the written script or whatever was provided them. Is that accurate? A absolutely. Yes. So they, they also had. They couldn't read what yeah. was given to them on the written page, yeah. you know, and here they, you know, here are operatives somehow getting access to at least some of that, I would yeah. assume, <laughs> bringing it back and, and expecting our people to do, what would create something based on a subset yeah. but, of, of but something they have. But remember though, uh, actually, they had uh, reptilians there that looked like humans, mm -hmm. okay, they had reptilian guys there that looked just like us that they could go ask to help us out here. We didn't have anything like that in the United States. We just had these frivolous packages with notes in them. Do you think that any of the well-known Nazis that were photographed were actually reptilians? Uh, I, I never thought that, but other people had said they thought some of them were. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yet. I never thought it, Okay. but I don't know. But we're just trying to say, please, you've got to realize how hard this was on American organizations to take this information and run with it. And uh, if you stop and think, what you just said was that somebody in the Navy gave Lockheed Aircraft Company one of these packages. and. Four years later, the skunk works get started. And so, isn't this upside down with what you thought? Uh, and so, yes, the programs were secret in every one of the companies, uh, organizations, but the information is leaking out. Uh, and uh, eventually, the skunk works becomes reality. Uh, and it's sort of like a small think tank at Lockheed. Uh, but it starts from a package out of two-star Admiral's office in North Island. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's interesting when you visualize this system that was going on and the complexities with which uh, you're trying to help people do something when you don't give them the tools to do it. Yeah, I'm sure, this, I'm sure others have asked you this question too. I mean, World War II, if, if the Nazis, the SS, whoever has been provided this, I mean, this is advanced technology based on what you're describing here. I mean, we didn't, we couldn't hold a candle to any of that stuff. How did they lose, how did they lose the, the firing battle war, with the bullets and all that? I mean, we went over there, we mowed over Europe and we, Fettered out all the Nazis and yay, go America. America, right? NATO. We won over there. Did we win? You didn't win the war. You did not win the war. Okay? Even before the war started, a blonde young lady was contacted to put together a group of friends and be influenced by extraterrestrials to design and build a massive propulsion system in a large space transport. Bob, did you have uh, a thought? Did you want to toss in there? You looked like you had a... Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Okay. And so... so uh, uh, well, yeah, so Maria Orsic... Yeah, Maria, Maria was doing this, okay? And she was doing it 
uh, some of it in Antarctica, okay? And so the SS finds out about this and they confiscate all of the people and all the equipment and everything they're using and sort of make them slaves, but just for a very short period of time, less than four months. And then the SS gave it all back to them and said, you guys go ahead and work with the extraterrestrials you're working with. We're working with these extraterrestrials. Doesn't that seem to run counter wow. to whatever their agenda? Let's talk about the agenda. I mean, why would, why would the reptilians give the, the SS all this technology? There's got to be some kind of agenda behind that. And if it's domination, whatever it is, why would they take it, especially advanced technology like that, and then give it back? Uh, Okay. Doesn't that, doesn't that run counter to the goal? I'm assuming the goal is they just want to take over the world or whatever. Yeah. Well, uh, all these ladies became the 1,442 people in that book mm -hmm. right here, which is mentioned five or six times. Mm -hmm. uh, so they felt that there would be possibly additional technical assistance to the young ladies and the men that are working this, okay? Uh, her group, uh, which may be beneficial to them, and we're gonna let you develop your own. We've got all the assistance that we possibly could ever need right. to do this. So we took off, then the SS takes off on their own and goes past the young ladies and the other men that helped that organization. But Walter's question was, if, if they had such technology, how come they uh, let us win the war? And I guess the partial answer to that might be that they had their Hanabu 3, I think, in production. But I think they only were able to use it one night. Allegedly, they used it once and shot down a whole bunch of airplanes. But they didn't have enough to really defeat us in the air. That's point one. Point two is I think that they had kind of early on decided that they wanted to put their, their real strength down in Antarctica. So they, they shipped the majority of their UFO technology down there because their goal was really to go out into space, not necessarily just to beat the United States. But that's my speculation. Yeah, and, and Bob is right with that. Uh, uh, they go back to the missions. Back to uh, Hitler's mission with the extraterrestrials. First was Hitler wanted to take out all of the uh, people he didn't like, the Jewish people. So you just take them out, whatever way. Uh, but secondly, you take every man, woman, and child on this planet and put them in these in-mountain production facilities all over Germany and the occupied country, building thousands and thousands and thousands of extraterrestrial vehicle, military space vehicle, and operate out in the galaxy with these, along with the reptilian naval battle groups, and do the same thing, enslave every planet they can find out there off of every star they can find. But they never got thousands done before they lost the war. Yeah. What final word would you guys like to have before we close off this, this day? Oh, but before Bob sits with his, let me, let me try to say it. Um, the way, Bob's going to say it eloquently. I'm just going to rough something. Uh, I'll roll. Pers personally, wait a minute, no, personally, I want to see this information disseminated out across the planet, okay? I want the public to understand what has happened. I want that, uh, that they have sufficient information to uh, bypass this problem, I don't believe anything you're saying, uh, and start to accept this reality of extraterrestrials, okay? And uh, it's imperative to the people on this country to understand what their position is and this needs to be fixed and any help we can get from any extraterrestrials out there to 
counter some of these black hat people out there, uh, this is great for us. We need to get everybody involved. I've got a limited perspective at this point. I think there's two things that drive my, my thinking. One is the, the incredible sophistication that organizations, including governments, have had in keeping secrets. That's thought number one. And, and, uh, and I believe that that can be a convincing story, but it's a, it's a, it's a challenge because most people believe Washington can't keep secrets. And it's very difficult to get over that little hump. Uh, the second thing is I would say I'm not looking toward the aliens to solve our problems. I'm thinking that full disclosure will probably let the best results flop out. So I would say I'd go for full dis disclosure about everything, including disclosing things that would put a lot of people in jail because I think they deserve to be in jail. So those are my two main thoughts. And I think Bill's story really supports both of those, both of those arguments. Uh, Bill is himself trying to get the truth out. And I think the, the truth can set you free. Nothing wrong with that. Indeed. Well, someday we'll have that, shall we? Yeah. yeah it's better sooner than later. Better sooner than later. Yeah, I agree. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for watching uh, uh, my YouTube channel, Search for Truth Reality. This is uh, today with Dr. Uh, Robert Wood. Thank you. And uh, William Tompkins, as always, uh, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you all next time.